So if we go back about 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, like most other temperate fauna, they were pushed into what are called glacial refugia. These are areas in the south of Europe, which would have stayed, you know, nice and temperate uh, through the ice ages. So the European pond turtle was confined to uh, Spain and Portugal uh, and also to the Balkans. Um, and what we know from genetic analysis is as the ice retreated, the Balkan population spread up and into north northwest uh, Europe and the Spanish ones sort of spread up into in it well through Spain and into France a little bit but didn't manage to get up there so we know that the the European pond turtle that was in Britain uh, was of this Baltic uh, sorry Balkan uh, genealogy it was what we call uh, haplotype 2a Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Harvey Tweets, who, along with Tom Whitehurst, run the company Celtic Rewilding, which you should be familiar with because we've had them on in the past, but their business was formerly called Celtic Reptile and Amphibian, which we do discuss the name change throughout the episode. Today, I'm just joined by Harvey. Tom couldn't join us today, but it is an incredible conversation about rewilding landscapes, especially the project that they're currently focused on is the reintroduction of the the European pond turtle into Britain. And that's sort of the main premise of this episode, but really this episode dives into the philosophy of rewilding in general, what it means for humans and nature to coexist on the planet successfully and not just this simple solution that we always see is just get rid of humans you know we talk about what it means for humans and humans to thrive on the planet while also creating spaces for mother nature to thrive and how those two things can interact with each other in a positive synergistic way and not just in a destructive way which we often see now and Harvey impresses me every time I speak with him it sounds like you're speaking to a 75 year old man with, with a ton of life experience and really he's only 21 or I think yeah probably around 21 years old maybe 22 at the oldest and uh, he's just got an incredible perspective and for anyone that's looking for a passion project or something to sink their teeth into Harvey gives some incredible advice at the end of this episode so I do really hope you enjoy it let's jump into it awesome well Harvey welcome back to the podcast it's been a while it's been a while but it's but it's it's really great to be back I um it was weird because I thought in preparation, I'll just go and look at what we spoke about in the previous few times, but I bailed because it's so embarrassing. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I cannot watch myself. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so if we, uh, if we tread on trodden ground, I think it's been that long anyway, that it won't even matter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah. I never, I can never go back and listen to my old, old stuff. It just doesn't, doesn't sit well. But I, as you were running just now to go look for headphones, I looked just to see when the last one was and it was uh, September 5th, 2021. So it's been two full years. And since then the show has grown quite a lot. So if we do cover similar ground, I think that would be totally fine. There's a lot of new people listening to the show now that may have not heard those episodes. So uh, why don't we start there? We can kind of start with maybe giving a little bit of a background of who you are. And then also I'd love uh, an update and bring us up to speed with Celtic Reptile and Amphibian because I'm sure that's a pretty loaded question. Yeah. So my name is Harvey Tweets. I am a co-director of Celtic, Re uh, Cel well, I say Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. We've now actually changed to Celtic Rewilding. Mm. So um, we are a conservation company based in uh, Leak in Staffordshire. Um, and it's our mission to return uh, the rare and extinct species of reptile and amphibian that, are, that have uh, been missing from British ecosystems, as well as rewilding land and returning other species. Um, and we've, since we've last spoke, I mean, it, it's been a real whirlwind of a few years and, and we've helped on them. Um, in that time, we've helped on 16 individual projects um, helping to restore nature and whatever way we can um so yeah it's really exciting time at the moment um and yeah we're just trying to get as much done as we can mm. and and for those who are unfamiliar with it can you just quickly give us a little visualization of the the facility that you guys have built i think the first time we talked i don't even think the facility existed i think it was kind of in the backyard or your garden or maybe maybe tom's garden and now it, it's its own place and i think that the second episode we recorded kind of talked about that but for those who didn't hear that t tell us about your the facility so we started, um, uh, oh, when, when I was about 16, so that's so oh, five years ago now, so so quite a while, just in both of our gardens. And we were breeding 
native um, reptiles and amphibians, as well as the species which had gone extinct in Britain, um, largely to understand their husbandry, but also just as to, to fuel this burning passion for them. And it was in the summer, the late summer of 2020, that we decided that the collections were that big enough. So we'd, we'd, we'd got something like, I think it was about 16 species. It was over 200 animals or so that we'd actually amalgamate Tom's collection and my, my own collection into one. Uh, and that's when we set up Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. Um, we were a limited, co- we're a limited company, still are. Um, and we were able to procure um, an amount of funding. And that allowed us to uh, lease uh, an acre of land and build a breeding facility. So we've got the largest breeding facility of its type. So it's it's outdoor, primarily outdoor. Uh, we've actually got less species than we, than we started with, and that's just because we're focusing more on others. Uh, so we've got 10 species and um, we've got large outdoor enclosures, greenhouses, um, and a few sheds and buildings and things. Um, and the whole idea is breeding for conservation and not just conservation literally, but also things like uh, TV and media applications um, uh, and also the reintroduction projects. And the whole point is that the more we help to cement these animals uh, in cultures, so getting them on the TV, um, the better prospects they'll have for their conservation in the long term. You know, so um, we've. Um, We've we've bred, you know, this year we've bred several thousand uh, amphibians and and reptiles, and we've done really really well in terms of diversity. We're working with a number of zoos now as well uh, to establish stud books and and proper well maintained collections. Uh, and we've actually undertaken a, a rather large import of new stock this year that's just going through quarantine at the moment um, to help uh, w- with those stud books and those gene flows and things. Mm. Hence why you've been so busy. <laughs> That's a lot That's of things on the plate. Hey, can yeah, you- we, we've, the other thing as well is, is we currently manage a portfolio of about 15,000 acres. So we work with farms and estates across the country to help restore nature in whatever way we can. So this can go, uh, you know, this can go between things like the creation of new woodland, the creation of wood pasture, uh, as well as creating uh, new riverscapes. So where uh, we've we've re uh, rewilded rivers or rewiggled rivers, some people call it, to create new riparian habitats. Uh, and we've also done um, two beaver reintroductions this year. So we've um, helped to reestablish beavers in two different counties. Uh, and we've done other things like water vole reintroduction and stuff. So it's it's been, yeah, it's been mental. <laughs> Can you list off, uh, let's just give people a visualization of the, some of the species you are working with? You don't have to go through all 10, but maybe some of the the big ones. So in, in Britain, we are well known for being incredibly reptile and amphibian poor. Um, that was largely assumed to be because... Um, Britain was isolated from the rest of mainland Europe fairly early on after the end of the last ice age. But now what we've come to realise is that this is also anthropogenic. It's also caused by humans. So to give you an idea, we keep uh, common lizard, sand lizard and slow worm. So they're three of our uh, native lizards, the three native lizards. We keep smooth snakes, grass snakes. Uh, they're two of the three uh, native snakes. We don't keep the adder yet because we need a, a dangerous wild animals license for that, which is a bit ridiculous, but hey-ho. Uh, we've got the Escalapian snake, which uh, we think possibly lived in Britain. There needs to be a bit more evidence uh, to suggest so. And then when it comes to um, the amphibians, we've got European tree frogs, moor frogs, and agile frogs. So they're the three lost species. Um, and we've got other different species like eyed lizards and western green lizards and wall lizards and things as well. They're primarily there because they've been introduced to Britain, so they're not native, but they're used for filming and TV and that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Hey, can you talk a little bit about just the ecological history of, of Britain? Because like when I when you talk about, you know, reintroducing some of these things that haven't been here for, you know, thousands of years or hundreds of years, I some of it obviously is anthrop- like human caused, as you as you mentioned, but some of it obviously could be environmental or, as you said, isolated yeah. from Europe. But what what is the history of this, and and what are some of the reasons? Like, what are some of the anthropomorphic reasons that these animals have gone extinct from from Britain? 
So I'm very envious of you, Dylan, because you live in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, countries like Canada, countries like uh, North America and parts of Europe have been very lucky because by and large, your ecosystems have remained intact. Um, yes, there are issues and they're always going to be where people are, um, but you have been able to maintain ecological integrity. In terms of ecosystems on this island, we don't have any ecosystems. We have totally hemorrhaged our natural biodiversity, our natural ecosystems to the point that they're now on the brink of collapse. In fact, some people even say, you know, we're not at the teetering over the edge of the cliff. We're already we've already hit the rocks at the bottom. One in six species in Britain are, are facing extinction. We are one of the most ecologically degraded countries on Earth. So we've got an incredibly unintact e um, ecological integrity. Um, many species have, have declined since the 1970s, but also uh, hundreds of species have, have declined or gone extinct since 1500 as well. And the reason why, I mean, to put it plainly, is, is Britain is, um, you know, always has been a, a developed country. You know, we've always kind of been at the centre of the world. At least we thought we, we were at the centre of the world. And um, we know that ecological declines have been happening, you know, since 14,000 years ago or thereabouts. So, you know, we've we came into these islands as hunter gatherers. We wiped out the megafauna. We started to burn forests down, uh, burn peatlands down, uh, remove huge areas of fen wetlands. Um, and that all happened before, you know, places like yourself in, in Canada and places like the Amazon happened. And so the issue is one of baselines. So there's a there's a well-known um, term within um, within uh, conservation called shifting baseline syndrome. And this is this idea that when you're at your youth is what people think is ideal. That's what you think is is where we need to get back to. Mm -hmm. Now, for places like, you know, the Amazon, for places like Southeast Asia, that's fine, you know, because roughly in the 1970s, 1950s, you had a pretty intact ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But in Britain, primarily most stuff had gone extinct by then anyway. So, you know, we'd lost our wolves, we'd lost our bears, We've lost 99% of our ancient woodlands. Um, and so even if we were to rewild, per se, back to a 1970s baseline, we'd have a very degraded ecosystem. Mm. So you start from a position which is incredibly depreciate, incredibly um uh, degraded. You know, we started from a situation where, you know, even within the last 200 years, we've destroyed our ecosystems. And so in Britain, if we have any means of restoring some functionality, some sense of an ecosystem, we've got to look further uh, into the past than we would think. And the most amazing thing is the lost histories of our fauna. If you dig into the past and you look at areas where, you know, special fossils have been preserved for thousands of years, we're able to rebuild what we actually had. There's a very special place in Britain, um, which most people take for granted, and that is the Fens. The Fens are a huge wetland area, very large, about almost the size of Yellowstone, actually, in their extent, um, on the eastern seaboard uh, of England. It's, some of the land is even actually below sea level. It's quite, quite crazy. And the Fens are heavily farmed now heavily heavily farmed but they have preserved this rich history of what we've lost and we know from these um uh, these fossil assemblages that we've lost things like the agile frogs the blue moor frogs the pool frogs and we know that this once would have been a large wild wetland it is now very very farmed very intensively farmed because of how rich the 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 peats are there and increasingly, techniques are now being used, um, and we've actually helped with some of this, at looking at ancient DNA analysis. So we're now able to take tiny vials of soil um, and test them for what DNA is actually left within them. And we can now recover these species um, you know, back from extinction, which is, which is absolutely incredible. To give you an idea, you can see the horns behind me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, these are actually 120,000 year old uh, aurochs horns. These are actually originally from Germany, um, but they give you an idea as to some of the beasts we've lost in Britain. So are those a, are those a fossil or are they just like a, a replica? They're a real fossil. They're the real deal. That is so amazing. One, one of them, this one, was going to be uh, we. My parents bought me for Christmas, uh, but the other one was going to be sold off. Um, I think it was going to um, some Chinese millionaire or something. And I decided to buy the second one um, because I wanted to keep them as as one. So it's one aurochs. So to give you an idea, the distance between the two tips of the horn is around about three foot. So the, the, it's, it's big. Um, that's roughly the height it would have stood as well. Now, the aurochs wow. is pretty, pretty cool uh, because it's it's the ancestor of all cattle. So uh, all cattle descend from from the aurochs, and um, it was it was much more imposing than the, the cows we see in fields today. Um, aurochs unfortunately perished uh, in 1627. So the only remaining population they'd been slaughtered elsewhere, so completely annihilated from everywhere else, uh, was in Jacktoro Forest in Poland. And the only reason why they survived was because of royalty. Royalty actually hunted these animals um, and had very um, sort of weird um, ritualistic purposes for them. One of the things that uh, that uh, the kings used to do was hunt these bulls down. Uh, and while they were still living, sorry if this is a bit gory, but while the bulls were still living, they'd actually remove the forelocks. So they'd cut along the forehead and remove the skin between the horns. And then that piece of skin would be used by by the ladies within the royal family, um, and it would be tied onto a belt, and that was a sign of fertility. So there were really odd reasons why they preserved these animals. Um, And unfortunately, um, they perished in 1627 because of neglect. They were neglected by the royal family, the people who looked after them, the forest keepers were neglected pay uh, and those sorts of things. And the animals slipped into extinction. The amazing thing is that there may be a chance that it comes back. Um, the Because all cattle descend from aurochs, there's this potential that um, uh, the aurochs the genes are still within modern cattle. Mm. So if we breed selected cattle together, we think we can actually produce an animal which is similar to the aurochs. So are, are modern day cattle just uh, an evolutionary shoot off of aurochs or or did or is are the cattle something that man has developed over time breeding aurochs like sele- selectively breeding in captivity and domesticating them into cattle or I mean that's almost the same question but I'm I'm just wondering did cattle kind of come off on their own kind of on a like are they technically their own species or did the aurochs get molded into cattle we have today it's kind of both, Dylan. I, mm. there's, there's two. There were two domestication e- e- events that caused cattle um, to become domesticated. Uh, one was in the Middle East. So most cattle, so European cattle, and most cattle in around you in Canada will be from these cattle originally from the Middle East. Mm. But then there was a second domestication event that happened in the Indus valley so uh, on the border between india and pakistan um and that was what uh, we get our the other part of cattle they're the more tropical breeds so the ones you see in places like the amazon unfortunately on sad uh, photos of where the amazon's being cut down for cattle ranches uh, the cattle you see there are are this um are the uh, indocene cattle which is this more tropical one uh, the european aurochs which is the one i know more about um, was was 12 individuals were taken uh, somewhere around the Middle East um, and they were domesticated. So it was probably uh, young cattle, uh, young calves were taken away from uh, cows, from family groups. Um, and because it was only 12, because it was such a small population, um, there are some differences between the cattle that then, um, you know, came from that group than the aurochs. What's interesting, though, is as these domesticated domesticated cattle started to move into Europe um, and up into northern Europe, the aurochs interbred. Mm. So 
we think of farming now as big red barns, fields with nice fences and hedgerows and, you know, farmer Giles with it, with his cattle. But back then, farming was very different. It was more nomadic. There were no fences. You cast your cattle out onto the hills and the cattle would, would be feral and you'd round them up at the end of the year. And so there was plenty of time for aurochs to actually intermingle uh, with cattle. And that may have also been one of the reasons that they went extinct and were exterminated was because they were seen as a threat, because you, you're going from a docile cow crossing with a wild aurochs, which, you know, is eight foot tall, and you're getting a, a, a half breed between the two that's also wild and feral. Um, and so we actually can look at cattle's uh, DNA structure and we found that certain breeds are more closely related to the aurochs because of this historic uh, interbreeding than others. And we can right. combine those together to produce an aurochs again. I've actually got I've got a uh, another aurochs horn here. So this is this is from a young animal. Um, and you can see you've got the the front. This is where the skull would be. The the orbits, the eyes. It's some dust has just come off that. Shows you how, shows you how much to take this down. But anyway, you can <laughs> see you know, what's classic about the aurochs is this this curl. So you have got this curl on the horn, and that is used for maximum damage. You know that like that. Um, and so this this would have much more to grow. Um, but yeah, and the other thing that was a bit different to aurochs to modern cattle, if I get my second aurochs, you can see this is the front. This is the maxilla of a of an aurochs from the same individual as that partial skull. Is that the face was a lot longer, mm. so it's a lot a lot longer face. And we think that um, aurochs would have been wetland specialists, so they would have lived within these wetlands and required probably a longer face in order to get to those reeds and grasses amongst the wetlands but the dentition is very very similar to cattle so it looks easy. yeah very similar they're, they're very hard to tell apart uh in the archaeological record in fact uh in britain there's a point about um two thousand years ago where you can't tell the difference and there's a bit of a gradient to where we think the cattle and the aurochs were inter interbreeding and the aurochs then dwindled to extinction mm -hmm. so the thing is about aurochs to give you a comparison to you guys in canada in the states is that's our american bison you right. lost american bison you know not long ago 200 years thereabouts i think is when yeah. they were pretty much you know we're looking at an animal which we lost 2000 years ago so that's so that's kind of a nice comparison in terms of there's a 10 times bigger difference of ecological loss in britain and northern europe as there is to you guys over in the new world yeah yeah and that's a great analogy too plus the fact that ours is only 200 years ago we still have plenty of american bison here you know they're still an animal we still have tons of wildlife reserves you know yellowstone that you'd mentioned or people farm them so at least we still have biological examples that yeah. you can look at and see wow it's kind of amazing to think like thousands of these were you know wandering around and yeah it, it's really incredible and there's to me, when I listen to you speak about the oryx, and that's why I, I really wanted to talk about it with you, is like there's something about it that motivates you, or it means something deeper. It seems like when I hear you talk about it, than just the fact that you're you know you're interested in an ancient bovine creature. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's something more to it. Do you know what that is, or is it? Have you thought about that? Uh, it's interesting, really, because um, doing some reading, there was a lot of when, when the Celts and obviously you'll know that our organization is called Celtic Rewilding. The Celts knew of the aurochs, whether they knew of the British aurochs is, is different, but they knew of this creature and thought of it as supernatural because of its um, its allure, its wildness, its untamability. And I think there's a part of that. I really do. But I think also it's a perfect metaphor for what we're all trying to do. Mm. The aurochs survives in modern cattle. It's there. You know, the, the components to build it again are there. It will never be the same. You know, we can't breed select, select breeds back together and reassemble in exactly the same replica. But we can get something that's in the ballpark. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with ecosystems. For Britain, the components are there. 
but there's only a few species in Britain which have gone extinct and have gone globally extinct. Everything else pretty much survives somewhere else in Europe. And if we can bring these parts back together, we're not going to get the same thing that we had, you know, 8,000 years ago, but we're going to get something that's beautiful again. One of them, um, uh, one of the real stars of the rewilding movement within Europe is a man named Franz Vera. He came up with, he he actually studied the aurochs a little bit, and he came up with this idea that um, Britain and Europe wasn't this continuous forest. So if you ask most people in Europe or Britain what they think uh, the landscape would have been like before, uh, you know, lots of influence from man people will say this ubiquitous forest you know this dark forest think of um sort of uh, red riding hood that type of fairy tale type thing um but what we now know looking at the the pollen so looking at preserved pollen is that it would have been far more open it would have been um there would have been huge areas of woodland don't get me wrong dense woodland but there would have also been these open areas of grassland and scrub and heath that would have all intermingled to create this mosaic and that makes more sense because most of our species in britain are light demanding so they they require some element of heat and uh, you know light intensity for instance the reptiles and amphibians need that um, but but to get back to what I was saying is Franz Vera very much says the same thing. That is if we can slip these species back into existence, we can use the components that we've got now to create something that's meaningful and beautiful again. Mm -hmm. And that's very much it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that's what's interesting. Like, you know, you're, you're creating these analogies of what we had in the past so they're they're very close and, and i mean with the species that you guys are working with they are virtually the same exact species it's just they are going to be different in the britain landscape now because of how yeah. different it is so is there there's obviously a bit of an not not i guess an ethical issue but not not necessarily just you have to think about it on a deeper level than just putting them back because how different the landscape and ecology is now so it's not quite the same so how how do you conceptualize that how do you conceptualize adding species back to an ecosystem that is so drastically different than than it was you know 2000 years ago the the thing that you have to do is really good research so at the moment we are primarily focusing on the reintroduction of the european pond turtle Mm -hmm. um, and we're incredibly excited by this reintroduction. Um, we've currently raised uh, Tom. Tom has the latest figures, but it's it's not shy of you know it's not far shy of forty thousand pounds for this reintroduction, which is really really good. Um, and the, re the the European pond turtle um, was a species that we had in Britain, uh, probably went extinct within the last five thousand years. And again, the same argument can be made. Why bring back a species which has been lost for so long? How will that work? So we have to do research. So we produced, uh, to give you an example, we produced this feasibility document uh, with the University of Cambridge. And this actually outlines the, uh, the sort of reasoning behind why we do it and whether it would work. And yes, there are some unknowns. You know, there's some areas where we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but there are, but people have done this work elsewhere. So we can pull that work back together. The reason we want to bring back the European pond turtle is again, not because we want to recover some halcyon lost period, but it's because this species might help us in combating climate change. We know that we're getting warmer summers. And we know that those warmer summers are actually putting uh, putting us at risk of algal blooms and algal blooms cause fish kills. And we think that the European pond turtle can be reintroduced back into wetland environments to help clean up uh, after these algal uh, algal blooms where the, the fish are killed and reduced the susceptibility of those ecosystems to getting uh, those blooms again. So we're very much taking a, an old thing, you know, something from thousands of years ago to help fix a modern problem. Mm. And that's how conservation should work. You know, it should should take a look into history, into the past to see what we had in order to help fix, solve, enhance modern issues. So it very much requires good and thorough study. Um, as it does actually visiting the places where these species survive. So we've been um, to um, a trip to Germany this uh, this coming year, back in September, 
uh, to not only look at reptiles and amphibians, but look at other species, uh, rare grasshoppers, uh, water voles, beavers, to actually see how people w live with these animals again. And we've actually, with the pond turtle project, we actually imported uh, 40 turtles uh, from Germany for the reintroduction. Um, where we are actually helping and modelling our reintroduction on the Bavarian reintroduction that's happening in Germany. So it's about this sort of collaborative approach and, again, pulling these pieces together, pulling these nuggets of information together to build something beautiful. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. I mean, because <laughs> there's over the history of our of mankind, especially in the last hundred years, there's been some serious blunders as far as re, like introducing, I shouldn't say reintroducing animals, just introducing animals into an ecosystem to solve a problem. You know, you can think about the cane toads in Australia, for example, and it's just, you know, like the worst thing ever as far as creating an invasive species that is impossible to get rid of. So I, I can imagine that, yeah, you, you almost, this kind of sounds mean to the animal, but think of the animal as a tool and what, what, can that tool be used for in our modern day ecosystem and how, how can it be implemented into an issue that we have? And the thing, the thing to remember is we're only working with species which we've got evidence for their existence here. Mm -hmm. And at the very most, they exist just over the channel. So for instance, um, you know, the, the, the moor frog and the agile frog, uh, live just over in the Netherlands, just over in France. You know, the gap between Britain and, and um, Calais in France, for instance, is only 20 miles. We're not bringing a species from Argentina, like the cane toad, to Britain. You know, it's nothing as radical as that. It is tiny movements. And the thing um, in terms of British and European conservation is to look at what you guys have been doing. So you guys in the States... Um, have really pioneered incredible conservation techniques. So one of the things with the European pond turtle is we've actually got to work with uh, Dr. Anders Rodin, who is one of the leading uh, leading Chelonian researchers um, in the world. And Anders has helped to reintroduce the balsam tortoise to um, New Mexico and Arizona, I think are the, the two places it's been reintroduced. The balsam tortoise is the largest uh, Chelonian native to the states mm. and it was previously thought to be extinct it was it was discovered in the 1960s uh, in Mexico um in a very sort of I think it was a series of of catacombs um and craters and it was a very uninhabited area um and it had a, a once much larger range going up into the southern US all in the arid regions and so it was devised that why don't they reintroduce it there after a 13,000 year absence? So the species has now been actually uh, reintroduced to a few places, including the Ted Turner Ranch. So Ted Turner, the media giant. Um, and it's now the successful uh, reintroduction of a Chelonian, which we're very much basing the European pond turtle on. But bear in mind that it's only been gone for, you know, 5,000 years or so. So there are examples of this happening elsewhere to great success. And, um, you know, what we're learning in conservation and, and in, in the current climate, you know, the current biodiversity uh, crisis and climate crisis is that we, we're going to have to call on novel solutions. Things have changed that much now. Uh, from where we were starting from, we're going to have to think outside the box because the set parameters have changed, you know, so we've got to change too. Do you think that humans only have business reintroducing animals? And I mean, this is, you have a lot of selection at this point, but do we only have business reintroducing animals that we have, we contributed to their demise in the first place? Or, I mean, because you could look at an ecosystem and say, yeah, there used to be these here and for some, whether climate reason or some geological event happened and now they're no longer in this space. Do you think there's any rewilding, a case to rewild in those scenarios or should we just mainly be focused on anthropomorphic demise? It's an incredibly important question, Dylan, and that is the, that is the million dollar question. Mm. Um, the problem we have uh, this this may be a bit of a convoluted answer, but um, we've got we've got time for it. Yeah, please. The problem we have uh, with lots of these things is actual actual certainty as to what caused the extinction. Mm -hmm. You know, so in Britain, we're working with a really really depauperate amount of evidence for things like frogs because you know the bones are tiny you know you're talking a, a, a bone that's that's smaller than your, the length of your fingernail 
Um, and not only that, but you've then got to identify that bone to the level of a species. And so the problem becomes really, really hard. And, you know, for instance, in Sussex, which is in the south in, 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 in England, um, a tooth was found of a mammoth. And that tooth turned out to be younger than any material we'd found before, pushing the date of extinction 14,000 years forward. So we now know we had mammoths much later on than we ever thought possible. And that's a bloody mammoth. That's, you know, <laughs> literally a mammoth, ginormous. So when it comes to things like frogs, we really don't know. But what we do know is we've lost species. You know, we've lost other species. And so to say that we haven't lost any amphibians and reptiles in terms of our, you know, our fauna is very, very naive. We know that... Um, we know that other places like the Netherlands and Denmark um, had a very similar species composition as to Britain. And we know that their rates of um, sort of destruction of the environment have been much less. And so we can draw from those. The, to answer your question about whether we move species or we reintroduce species which have potentially gone extinct due to climate has become a lot more muddied due to the fact that we've changed the climate now. Mm -hmm. So um, Richard Kerridge is a, a leading academic in um, environmental literature. He has written a book called Cold Blood um, and, it, and it did very well. It's, it's a book about British reptiles and amphibians and his connection to them. And he actually wrote as a piece within, within the feasibility report, which looks at the ethical stance on moving species beyond their current boundaries. And the thing that it considers is if we've caused climate change and we've caused the climate to, you know, potentially spiral into a state that's really quite scary, then um, we need to be moving species. It's really that simple. We can't draw as hard lines over this as, as we thought we could. Mm. So um, I think that it requires pragmatic and careful solutions to it. We shouldn't go, you know, all guns blazing into any of this, um, but we should be thinking a lot more quickly about how we do this. So when it comes to the European pond turtle, the first step that we're doing to ensure that its impact on the environment is, um, you know, hopefully positive, but also that it can breed and, and survive and thrive in this climate is to actually establish them in a large enclosure. So they're going to be established in a, in a six acre area. So it's going to be fenced. It's really large. And then we're going to test the different variables that we want to in order to see, you know, how the turtle responds to its new environment. This is exactly copying um, the Bolson tortoise reintroduction from the States. So we're copying the same methodology, albeit on a very different species in a very different environment, to test to test those parameters. So it is about this staged, pragmatic approach. We've just got to think differently. I mean, you know, conservation, there are so many heroes and, and there have been so many battles won, but we aren't winning the war. We're mm. still not winning. So we've got to think differently. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that you've, I, you and I have chatted about before. I think it's important to talk about too, is you don't have the that, that anti-human uh, sentiment that some conservationists have, which I, I find to be very unhelpful. And, and, you know, I, so I imagine in your mind, you must have some thought of how human civilization and nature can coexist in some way without, you know, because quite often you hear, let's just wipe humans off the planet. And that's, that's the, that's the easy solution. And I think of that as like, you know, somebody coming up on a whiteboard and writing a very complicated mathematical equation. And then that person goes, Oh, I have a great solution for it. Let's just erase it. So the problem's gone. It's like, well, congratulations. Thank you for, for your brilliant answer. But I, I don't think that's going to help in this situation. So there's got to be some give and take and some relationship that human civilization can have with an ecosystem or a healthy nature, a natural ecosystem. The thing we've got to remember is we are nature and nature is us. Um, we're not going to achieve uh, conservation or sustainability without balancing human and, and, and uh, human needs in the natural world. Rachel Raworth, who is um, one of the leading academics when it comes to sustainability, not necessarily conservation, but sustainability, 
defines sustainability um, as a balanced approach. So it balances human needs, natural world, etc. I can't exactly remember what all of them were, uh, but she's the leading academic on it. Um, and we can only achieve environmental sustainability with actually improving human lives. We know that um, if you raise people out of poverty, population stabilizes and even declines. But also the needs for, for instance, you know, take somewhere like Madagascar to go out and kill a plowshare tortoise and sell it, you know, becomes a lot less because why would you do that? You mm -hmm. know, not many people in, in Canada, I imagine, are going out and eating box turtles or anything or mm -hmm you know, uh, taking alligator snapping. To, I mean, they'll sure, sure there'll be, you know, some, but the needs are, are, are met. And so we've got to learn how to improve um, human life as well um, as maintaining and, and restoring the natural world. And that's where countries like Britain uh, and the rest of Europe and North America really come into the fore because we've got the means, the space to some extent, to restore these ecosystems and almost be sympathetic towards those nations which are trying to improve to a point you know where we are today so you know in britain one of the most you know vastly wasteful industries uh, is is sheep farming so sheep farming uh, is is dreadful really is and i say that you know as someone who's got farmers in the family uh, and who has ironically helped sheep farm in the past uh, and still does that occasionally, um, which is uh, rather ironic, but hey-ho. <laughs> the problem with sheep farming is that, you know, a tiny fraction of, of uh, Britons eat sheep. Uh, I mean, how popular is lamb in Canada, Dale? Um, Lamb, it's not super popular. You can order it, but I would say it's pretty far down, you know, under chicken and beef and pork. And, you know, yeah. it, it's people aren't eating lamb on a weekly basis. It might be like a couple times a year, I think anyway. And, you know, yeah. especially if you're Canadian, there are people who have immigrated from other countries that lamb might be more popular. But nobody, I've never heard anybody eating mutton here. Nobody eats like sheep. It's all lamb. So that that's really interesting because it's similar in Britain. It is slightly more popular. I've had to be honest, I've, I've, I've ate some lamb twice in the last week, which is really unusual, <laughs> uh, but that's just what we've had in the freezer. Um, and um, so think that, keep that in your mind that, you know, very small proportion of people eat lamb, uh, yet there are three times as many sheep in Wales, for instance, than there are people. <laughs> And so you've got this huge discrepancy of sheep to people. And Wales actually um, Wales actually imports seven times mu as much lamb as it exports. So, wow. it, it, again, it's this really weird discrepancy. And the reason why sheep are a problem is because that they are they've got these stiletto stiletto um, hooves that compact the soil and they've got a very, very short crop. So they actually eat virtually to the soil uh, and they favour tree saplings. And so we've got huge areas of Britain which are just just devoted to sheep farming. Uh, and the only reason why this is economically viable is because of subsidies. So subsidies mm. actually um, help to keep this industry afloat. The difference is, compared to places like Europe and America, is your subsidies are a lot more strict. And so that means that there are areas that don't need to be farmed. So you know, just that small example shows a gross misuse of resources, a gross misuse of money, but also land. And so it's looking differently at these spaces now and looking at what else they can produce. One of the issues with with uh, sort of farming is that it can assume the only value of land is the food it produces. And conservation and rewilding steps up to the fore and says, well, no, water purification, carbon sequestration, extinction prevention, et cetera, et cetera, are just as important and probably more important now than food, especially when we produce enough food to feed 10 billion people on the planet, mm -hmm. you know, and yet we waste so much of it. So we've got to stop, you know, using resources grossly. Um, and, and the richer countries have got to start rewilding now in order to allow poorer countries a bit of leeway in terms of developing. And then once everyone is hopefully developed, we can restore everything. But that's a very idealistic view.
<laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm glad that you said that because I think that there's a pretty obvious track, like a correlation between as uh, populations rise out of poverty, they begin to take care of their environment to their close the environment that's in close proximity to them more and because why would you care about the environment if you really just trying to find a couple of dollars each day to eat like you, you don't have time to worry about anything other than just not you know not starving to death or having your family starve to death so it's really important and yeah i think some of those subsidies that are government funded obviously keep us stuck in these old ways that there, there could be so many different types of farming that happen now we're just stuck in like this monocropping uh, factory farm method at this point which is efficient at producing food but is destroying the environment and it's actually in a lot of ways not healthy food you know it's when we start looking at corn yeah. syrup and and all and you know soybeans and all these things that are actually not that good for you but they are cheap and are they cheap or are they just being subsidized to be cheap and we're stuck in a, in a thing a friend, uh, Kevin Cox, is he's the, he's the chair of the RSPB, which is a big um, nature conservation organisation in the UK. It's the biggest. Uh, he says we pay for our food in three ways. We pay for it, the subsidy, so the tax. We pay for it at the checkout at the supermarket. And then we pay for it either as the issues we have for our health systems or the issues we have for our environment. Mm-hmm. And so why didn't we just pay for it all 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 at the till? You know, wh- why why do we have to spread it out over these three things? And I think that's a very interesting way of looking at it, is that you know it nothing is nothing is um, absolute. You know, it it's very much that if you do X, Y will happen. It doesn't matter where you try and hide it. Mm-hmm. So there are huge issues with with modern farming. Uh, but we know what the solutions are. You know, the solutions are fairly obvious, which is regenerative farming uh, and farming in a way which is which is sympathetic, but also eating less meat. You know, that's not no meat at all, but eating less meat and and, and finding places that are ideal for, for getting that. So, for instance, one of the rewilding projects in the UK, which is really, really famous now, uh, is is the Nep Castle Estate, and uh, we've been very lucky to actually work with Nep this year on helping to reintroduce the sand lizard, which is a um, a native uh, lizard, a very small lizard, and we've put it into an area that they've restored. Um, and the, um, the the really cool thing about Nep is that they've allowed their whole estate to rewild, so they've just let it go, but then they've reintroduced. The species which would have been there the herbivores so they've reintroduced the deer species they've reintroduced cattle wild cattle as a as a proxy for the aurochs they've reintroduced uh tamworth pigs as a proxy for a uh, wild boar uh, and then they've maintained these at natural levels but because we don't have wolves because we don't have bears in the uk anymore um they uh, have to cull the animals mm-hmm. you know which is understandable and to give you some context, Nep is just literally sort of 50 minutes outside of London. It's it's in an incredibly densely populated area. This will never be a Yellowstone. Uh, but what it has demonstrated is an incredible resurgence in life. So species like nightingale, turtle doves, purple emperor butterflies were not there. You know, there's some of the rarest species in the UK. And then now some of the biggest populations in the UK are found at Nep which is just absolutely incredible. And this all started in the last 20 years. It's only 20 years old. Anyway, the point I was trying to make is the animals are called to to be the predator, and that meat is some of the most sustainable ethical meat you can ever buy, partly because your money's going back into a rewilding project, but also these animals have lived wild. You know, they've, Mm -hmm. they've had the best husbandry, you know, if that's none at all. So... There are solutions to these and we are starting to tease out those solutions now. We just need to we need to implement and be a lot quicker. You know, we've really got to do this fast. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and in a scenario like that, you can probably produce a lot more meat than somebody might think. Like people think oh, you're seeing all these cattle being, you know, put through these cattle things to have them um killed or, or butchered inside a, a slaughtering yard and you think okay that's going to be tons of meat for everybody but i bet you can produce a lot of meat in a scenario like that where you you know you have a, a large chunk of land that's kind of renaturalized and it, it's going to pr- you know pr- provide meat for the community locally maybe you're not producing meat for the entire country but it's a pretty amazing how much meat comes off one cow exactly and the other thing to to bear in mind at nap 
is that the reason why they rewilded us was they were making no money from conventional farming. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> NEP is on um, thick, heavy clay. And this clay is as wet as porridge. It's like, um, you know, um, horrendous to work in the winter. Uh, but then it bakes as hard as concrete in the summer. So they were not competitive. And, and as uh, the food systems have globalized, especially over the last 30, 40 years, it's meant that net couldn't compete with other with other estates and, and, and farms elsewhere. So they had to turn to the wild. They had to change what they've done. And now they've created something which, yes, will not feed the country, but produces income, provides jobs and provides incredible meat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how many of those can you fit on the island <laughs> to, you know, help produce f- food for the country? You know, like, can, can we make sa- like little satellites of that same scenario? And w- what what species of deer is it? Is it the white-tailed deer or is that a, is it a different? I mean, that's our North America. We have several deer species in North America, but I wasn't sure which ones were native to uh, Britain. You know that dust I brushed off the um, aurochs on? I've just <laughs> I've breathed some in. <laughs> yeah, take your time. If you need to uh, wash down the 12,000-year-old dust. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in terms of deer in Britain, we've got um, roe deer, which is our equivalent of white-tailed deer. However, it's smaller and uh, its antlers are also smaller. They're more sort of stubby. They're almost like just two twigs. Okay. Uh, we've got the red deer, which is our which is our elk. Okay. So the red deer is just slightly smaller than elk, um, and it's the same sort of uh, body structure, same sort of how it, you know, very heavily built compared to a, a white-tailed deer or a roe. We also have a moose which weirdly we call elk, if that makes sense. The moose, unfortunately, uh, again, probably about a thousand years ago. So we've got three similar species to North America. Uh, And then in terms of our carnivores, we've got, you know, um, wolves. Uh, We used to have wolverine and we we used to have bear as well. So we we actually had a very similar mammalian fauna as to, you know, what's found in Canada and America. Mm. Um, And... In terms of other large animals, we obviously had the aurochs. Uh, we had bison, um, but there's the, their history again is a bit more, a uh, bit, bit harder to tease out than the aurochs. Um, we obviously, as I say, had the moose, um, but the, all these animals created this, you know, very sort of um, rich and dynamic ecosystem, which would have pulsed. So the idea that it would have been like a kaleidoscope. You know, woodlands would have moved as grazing changed over centuries. And these mm-hmm. huge, you know, migration routes would have created this really rich tapestry. Um, and then you have all the reptiles and amphibians under the feet of the, the aurochs sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. What was really interesting is um, one of my colleagues, um, she was actually in uh, the Netherlands, um, looking at where they'd rewilded some dune systems. So they'd... They'd taken a, a huge uh, area of, of coastal dunes and they'd reintroduced bison. So they'd put European bison in. So not North American. We do have we do have our own bison in, in Europe. And not only had the bison actually opened the dunes up, so they'd, you know, when they uh, when bulls scrape the, the ground before they charge, um, they created these areas where sand lizards could actually lay their eggs. So sand lizard populations had gone up. But also the Netherlands leave their wild herbivores out in the environment to rot down. And mm. so uh, bison had just were, were dead and there were carcasses and things just lying about. And that's where all the baby frogs were. All the baby t- natterjack toads and things were actually around the carcass because that's where all the flies and maggots and everything was to feed them you know, back into the ecosystem. So we forget these very small things that uh, we've stopped doing because of legislation, uh, because of different norms, whatever, which provide novel uh, homes for many of these species. So one of the one of the most amazing species, you know, that I've had, and you know, an absolute privilege to work work with, um, is the beaver. So the beaver is has been reintroduced to Britain. So it started to be reintroduced uh, back in two thousand and one. That was the first project. Um, it's since grown and grown and grown. 
And this year we've actually brought Reavers back to uh, my home county, so Staffordshire. We've reintroduced them to to the Trenton estate, um, which is rewilding in its own way. Um, and and it's been, you know, years of hard work for the team there to get them back. The beaver is a force of nature. It creates these most incredible environments for, you know, all manner of species, reptiles and amphibians included, but also for people too. An animal which can hold back water, which stores carbon, which, uh, you know, increases resilience to wildfires. You know, this animal is amazing and we must restore it to everywhere, you mm. know, and, and that's where people like yourselves, you know, over in Canada, you know, you, you guys have, have really been, you know, decades ahead of us. You know, you were launching beavers out of helicopters and planes <laughs> back in the 1930s to restore this animal. And we're only just starting to do it now. Um, and the problem is, I mean, you know, you look at these things, Dylan, and do you know what? You you just you just stare into this total whiff waff of bureaucracy. You know what we face in Britain is we've just lost our environment secretary. She's just resigned, and God, I heard all the all the birds in the forest congratulate. You know, I think they were they were uh, having champagne parties and things. <laughs> you know, we've got a culture, a political class, which you know it's their whole imperative is to try and bring down any sense of joy, any sense of beauty in this world. And that's what it's to try and do. And I understand it's the same in, in Canada. It's the same in, in Europe and places. But I think Britain, we, we're on another level. I mean, we really have done what we can to take what is beautiful from this world. It's that and removal of, of nuance. I mean, you can even exactly, see it in yeah. their the architecture yeah. of their buildings, and it's just everything's boring and drab, and you know, paperwork, <laughs> yeah. and it's just it, you're so right. It just removes art from from our lives. A hundred percent. And and the the thing with someone like Therese Coffee is she um, there was a beaver project in the Forest of Dean, which is a large area of, of uh, semi natural woodland in the UK, and she back it was about five years ago purposefully rang up to try and bully um, civil servants below her to stop this beaver reintroduction going going ahead, all because she vehemently believed that it was the right thing to do. And, you know... Well, luckily, what was her problem with beavers? What, what was her position? She's in a situation where um, she is very much supported and rallied by the farming industry and not a farming industry that um, is is very nice. You know, you're talking huge, intensive dairy unit farmers, that sort of thing. Uh, the National Farmers Union in the UK is, is a really interesting organisation because, you know, most of the farmers that I've worked with and farmers in my family are not are really not that supportive of them. You know, they only support the biggest farms, only support, you know, horrendous, mechanised, horrible farming and things like that. And so you got someone who was supported by those interests um, and she was just dreadful. I mean, just 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 an absolutely horrible person. You know, would have done a better job at ruling more Mordor, I think, than Sauron. I mean, it's just it. But you know, we we carry on and and we just keep going. Um, so yeah, it, it's the political situation is is really really interesting in Britain. Um, but we lead the way and we keep pushing and we keep pushing and that's it. You know, it's, yeah, that's yeah. it. Hey there, I want to take a quick break to thank this week's sponsors. First, we have Exotics Keeper Magazine, which is a herpeticulture-based magazine out of the UK. Many of you are probably already familiar with them as we had their editor, Thomas Marriott, on a few weeks ago. And it is really a quintessential hobbyist magazine. When you flip through the pages of the monthly magazine, it really does, for me, brings me back to being a kid. I think many of us would have experienced reptiles and amphibians for the first time in either magazine or books. And this just brings me back to those moments. Exotics Keeper Magazine provides new news, stories, and information surrounding the care and welfare of exotic animals. And you actually recognize quite a few of the authors that write the articles within each issue. Both Roy from Project Herpeticulture and Liam and Ellie from Reptiles and Research have actually contributed to the magazine in the past. I know Roy has an article about Spilodes coming up in a couple of months or might already be out by the time you're hearing this. So I'm very much looking forward to that. If you are living in the UK for only a couple of bucks a month, you can receive the hard copy of the magazine, which I'm incredibly jealous of because there's something about 
reading a hard copy that is just so exciting. But for everybody else in the world or for those in the UK, the digital copy of this magazine is free. All you have to do is go to their website, put in your email, and every month the issue will be delivered directly to your inbox and you can flip to the magazine for free, which I've really enjoyed. But I hope that more of us can sign up for the digital copy and show EK that we want that there's enough interest to actually start having the physical copy go out to the rest of the world. So that's my goal with this ad. So very much go check them out. It's an incredible magazine. It really does bring me back to being a child and I'm sure it will with you as well. And the other way you can help support this podcast is by checking out the other sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. That is the incredible enclosures behind me. They were sponsored by Custom Reptile Habitats. If you're looking for more information on them, you can head to the affiliate link in either the show notes or the YouTube description. If you click that link and you end up making a purchase, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that is a way you can help support this podcast. Back to the episode. And, and like you said, you know, you know, like talking about leaving the carcasses out or, you know, all these amazing things that pop out when we just let nature do its thing. I mean, sometimes I think as humans, we try to like overthink things and try to think, how is this going to play with this? And if you just let an ecosystem develop and establish, you'll see amazing things happen and you'll see, suddenly see, oh, that's how, you know, mother nature solves this problem. And I remember one of the the fascinating courses I took for my degree was, I think it was called Forest Botany. And it was just about how forests evolve through time as well. And I think you, you kind of mentioned this, like moving tapestry over time. When we think of forests, because we our lives are on such a short time scale, you just think oh, that's the forest. And that's how that forest always is. But really, the landscape is constantly changing as the deciduous trees die off you start getting conifers and and you know evergreen trees come up and then they drop their needles and you get these bog and this peat swamps and and it's just this incredible cycle that goes over hundreds of years and and uh, yeah in a lot of ways we just kind of have to stand back and, and watch it happen and something like the beaver that just exists and knows exactly what to do on these landscapes is, is pretty fascinating and you had posted a picture on instagram maybe a year ago with uh benedict cumberbatch in in i think relation to this uh beaver reintroduction can you talk a little bit about that yeah so uh benedict cumberbatch very interesting one there was a there's uh, what was co- I went to an event called Saturday Night Beaver um, in uh, London, <laughs> yeah, uh, and um, it was it was really surreal. So we had um, we had who was there? So we had Benedict Cumberbatch was there, Ellie Goulding, uh, and then Joanna Lumley. So all these celebrities um, just gathering to celebrate the return of the Br- Beaver to Britain. And I mean that that's just incredible. You know, you've got celebrities putting money into beaver restoration, which is just unheard of. And actually, just as you asked me that question, Dylan, I got a message through saying we just had a license approved for Lincolnshire. So we just so literally just wow. natural England has sent saying that we've got a license approved for Lincolnshire. So um it's it's really amazing and it snowballed into this uh you know great restoration of a species. Uh, but again, it's a situation we've got to do it quicker. We've got to we've got to get these species, you know, this species out everywhere so it can help produce these ecosystem services. Be- because you salt the beaver, and the beaver sorts everything else. You know, it knows what to do. It creates these living spaces, these corridors, which just produce life. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've just got to get on and do it. Benedict Cumberbatch loves frogs, just for everyone out there. Um, so, and he think, legitimately loves it. He's not just there because he needs to put his money somewhere because he's a rich celebrity. He's obviously actually interested in this. I mean, he he knew, he he. Uh, someone introduced me to him and said, "This is the frog man." So I got talking, and yeah, apparently he likes frogs, and he in That's a, cool. specifically tree frogs. So, um, so yeah, we'll see what comes of that. I mean, um, I've got some, you know. I've got some friends who I shouldn't really say this, but we've got some friends who work who have worked for him. Um, so who knows? I mean, we'll see. <laughs> That's cool. I I really want to spend a little bit more time talking about the European pond turtle because you 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 know you talked about it, you mentioned it, but I I want to because that is a, a really major project that you guys are working on, and you talked about this six acre enclosure, if we can even call it that, because it's a massive enclosure. I assume that's down the road. Maybe you could just bring us up to speed with what's happening at Celtic right now with them. You know the setups that you have them in, the the breeding that's going on. So, uh, what is help, uh, happening at Celtic? We just spent seven thousand pounds on a new quarantine facility. Uh, this is a building which is we've we've perfected the design of, 
Um, my sister is um, a bit of a builder. She she's very good at design and actually building the the enclosures as well. Um, and so we've come up with this this design called a TTE Frog House. And what it is is it's a wooden structure uh, with concrete foundation, um, and it's half polyethylene. Uh, and we use a special type of polyethylene which allows UV to pass through. Um, and then it's half mesh. So it's polyethylene on the apex of the roof and halfway down the sides, and then the rest is mesh. Um, and that creates this perfect environment, which doesn't get too warm, uh, but also stays, you know, two, three degrees warmer than outside. Uh, and that just means that the turtles are, are, are just slightly better. You know, they they um, they produce better eggs and that sort of thing. Now, what we needed to do was source the right turtles. So European pond turtles are not common, but not rare in captivity in Britain. Uh, but the problem is, is they've lost their genealogy. So they've either been interbred or we don't actually know what they are, you know, what what sort of uh, genetic lineage they are. Now, we happen to be working with the Bavarian reintroduction uh, in Germany, and they happen to procure a large group uh, of European pond turtles, which they're using to reintroduce to the wild. And they had, luckily, some surplus for us. So if we go back about 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, like most other temperate fauna, uh, you know, even aurochs and uh, other things, they were pushed into what are called glacial refugia. These are areas in the south of Europe, which would have stayed, you know, nice and temperate uh, through the ice ages. So the European pond turtle was confined to uh, Spain and Portugal uh, and also to the Balkans. Um, and what we know from genetic analysis is as the ice retreated, the Balkan population spread up and into north northwest um, uh, Europe. And the Spanish ones sort of spread up into uh, sort of in it. Well, through Spain and into France a little bit, but didn't manage to get up there. So we know that the the European pontal that was in Britain uh, was of this Baltic, uh, sorry, Balkan. Uh, genealogy it was what we call uh, haplotype 2a mm -hmm. and uh, luckily the bavarians had some hungarian animals that were quite uh, genetically diverse but meted that genetic criteria so we raised a bit of money um, and we drove we drove all the way to germany um, in september uh, we managed to get all the paperwork sorted um, and we brought these turtles back. So we drove them all the way back. Uh, they're currently in hibernation, uh, but they settled into their quarantine enclosures really, really well. They'll undergo quarantine until maybe June next year, just to make sure everything's OK, in which time our vet will look over them and we'll do regular health checks and things just to make sure they're OK. And then at that point, are they... Do you still work with them in your in in the on the, in the facility, or do you actually start working towards that six acre enclosure? So we hope um, we hope that we're not far away from procuring all the funding uh, to secure the enclosure. So it's going to be on. We're collaborating with a landowner on it. We're not going to reveal who they are yet until we've actually got the turtles there. But you have uh, somebody in mind that you're already talking with, and yeah. the land is theoretically there, ready for you guys. Yeah, so what's really cool is where the fossils for the European pond turtle were found, which confirms that they're native, there's a landowner not a million miles away from there. The Again, it was found in the fens. And that makes sense because the eastern half of Britain uh, is, is, is a lot more warmer in the summer. Mm. So it means that the, the, cha the best chances of egg incubation are in that eastern half of Britain. Um, so what we're hoping is once we've procured the funding and we can build the build the 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 herb fence to be able to go in, we think that that may be as soon as June, July next year. Wow. It's not far away. And it's, you know, a year ago, this was a this is a very blue sky thing. But now, you know, it's not far away at all. Now, have you had eggs incubate in the facility outside and successfully hatched? Like, do you know that they'll be OK in the climate or is that still a question mark? 
so no we haven't had any we've 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 not done very well for european pond turtle breeding to full stop to be honest um we think that that's partially just due to the fact that we've got a mixed we we have had a mixed group um and that uh, some of the females still take you know a few years to adjust uh, to the different sort of environment um but what we have had is turtles incubate elsewhere so we've got a friend chris chris davis down in hastings uh, on the south coast and he's had now successive um hatching events uh, over the past few years of turtles hatching in the wild and uh, this year luckily chris um gave us one of his uh naturally hatched uh pond turtles which is a huge cool. huge pleasure so we've got that turtle that turtle's currently in hibernation it won't see the wild that one uh but it but it's a bit of a token sort of thing so um so yeah so that that's going to be one of the things is to test the variables the problem is we're kind of on the west coast not really we're in the middle but mm. we're not in the ideal release location uh for the species right so, yeah. so tell me a little bit more about that six acre enclosure so you'll fence it off in some way to keep the animals in there but obviously you can't protect them from predation and whatever else uh what what sort of things go into making sure that it's uh, you know a safe enough environment for them but also simultaneously giving giving them you know the real shot at living in the wild so the the, the thing is is that the turtles um are going into an area which um, is quite well managed it's not necessarily a rewilding project full scale um, and so things like usual predators uh, like foxes and things we are, are known quite well they're actually managed uh, to some extent um and the thing about them is that turtles by and by and large are very very um hardy at withstanding sort of the these predators it's only in very circumstantial uh, situations that they're actually predated it's the young which are a lot more vulnerable each turtle have an individual tracking um live gps tracker uh, set against it and we'll also have live feed cameras within the area that will tell us the whereabouts of different turtles um we aim to um monitor the site daily so the turtles will be checked daily um, and if there are any sort of um issues in terms of if turtles injured or anything like that there uh, there is funds to remove that animal and have it seen to by a vet so there will be interventions where where possible um and what what we hope to do is to establish how well these turtles are able to acclimatize and breed in this environment again um and that's going to be the big thing you know rather than predation uh in in germany and places there's a real worry about raccoons so raccoons yes, yeah. are introduced to europe they're not uh, not native but luckily in britain we don't seem to have any emerging populations. So uh, chats with some of the guys over in Germany um, are actually talking about, you know, whether in Britain, if they are successful, um, reintroducing them here will be great because it will allow them to have a safeguard uh, against um, potential extinction by raccoons. Raccoons eat the eggs, you see, so they're mm -hmm. able to detect where the, 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 egg, uh, where the nests are. I assume turtles in Canada and the US have must be, you know, evolved hardwired against raccoons. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, raccoons are definitely a problem, especially if you have chickens and whatnot, because they raccoons have hands, so they can just get into anything and rip things. I have heard of people like I remember years ago, Camp Kennan had done a video of his turtles getting uh, eaten, like the actual adults getting eaten by by raccoons and really they just eat like an arm or a leg or, or a head and leave the rest but I, I don't know if those were native species or those were something that maybe didn't have the evolutionary mechanism to protect themselves but yeah raccoons can definitely be a problem for sure and I, so I'm curious so this is more of like a test arena for them and let's just say they they do well in this environment then is the next step uh, a potential legitimate rewilding you know five ten years down the road the next step is exactly that. So we want to present our findings um, uh, after about five years, and that will coincide with an application. So a li uh, so an application for a license to just remove the fence. Mm, so gotcha. that's what we want to do is is um, you know is to open the fence, take the fence down, 
one of the interesting things that I've said to people about this, you know, people who've got a bit funny about putting a fence around it, you know, why aren't you going for just a license? The reason why is this is what you do anyway. So because um, female pond turtles are quite, um, because they're quite faithful uh, to nesting sites, uh, in order to sort of heft them or bind them to a nesting site, you have to do this. You have to fence them in so they know where to lay their eggs. And then you take the fence down after a period of time. So we do it anyway, sort of thing. So, yeah, it's kind of um, it's kind of one of those. We, we're we're going to do it and then apply for a license, to, you know, down the road. The yeah, reason yeah. we're not jumping the gun is just in case we don't see what you know we want to see. Uh, which is incubation and, and a hopefully positive effect on, um, you know, uh, the environment. Yeah, yeah. That's. Do do you visualize ten years down the road going to a wild wetland area and seeing pond turtles and like I can't. Uh, that would be a bizarre experience to know that really like you have such a a a, a powerful role in that if it were to come true. That's the dream. I mean, you know, we we re- where we reintroduced beavers to Trenton this year, you know, to go out on a on a summer's night and see those animals, you know, actually hear them <coughs> felling trees. Mm-hmm. It's just something else. You know, it is just it's one of those moments in life when you know that you've just done the right thing. It's genuinely, you know, every sinew of your existence knows that that was the right thing to do. And so that is the motivating dream. The dream really is, is to be, you know, walking through on a really hot summer's day through Norfolk, through uh, East Anglia, you know, coming across a, a small river valley where there's, you know, water that's just spilling out into the margins. And you've got these, you know, dead fallen limbs in in, in the water and there are basking pond turtles. That's mm-hmm. the dream. Wouldn't that be amazing? And it also goes as far with the frogs. I mean, to imagine on a you know on a warm summer's night you've got these this raucous call these raucous calls of tree frogs and pool frogs uh, again would just be you know incredible and in the spring to see huge you know thronging areas of, of blue frogs you know the more frogs you know across the edges of lakes it'd just be incredible and that's why we all do what we do i mean you know that's why we keep animals that's why we're engaged in the conservation of them is because you know, we want to see that, I think, you know, mm-hmm. everyone sort of wants to see that sort of future. So, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And obviously you'd already mentioned there is a, you are, you have a, I think a GoFundMe set up and you have already almost hit $40,000 or 40,000 pounds, which is an amazing. You've mentioned some of the things that cost money for this sort of thing, but maybe you can just kind of remind people, of, you know, what the, those uh, funds go towards and then also how they can actually support this if they're interested. Yeah, so we've got a GoFundMe. Um, we're currently we're not up to forty thousand on the GoFundMe. Uh, I think we're up to about I think it's three thousand. Uh, we've raised forty thousand through grants we've applied to. Gotcha. Uh, and, and and to be honest, that was some of those grants have been an absolute lifesaver. Uh, but what we want the GoFundMe to do is allow people who who believe in this vision, you know, who think that that there's there's really something in this to have an involvement in in this project so if you really are interested in joining me and restoring this species back to britain uh, back to where it belongs uh, then please give whatever you can um to this to this uh, this crowdfunder it, i'm sure it'll be in the link will be in the description won't yeah. it um and and the thing is is that currently you know we've just spent 7000 on a new quarantine facility to fence the area. We're looking at about fifteen thousand pounds to put a fence around the six acres to dig the ponds out. It's a further three thousand uh, pounds. Then the travel budget for to be able to fund us and our scientists t- to go out to the project is looking at about two thousand pounds. You know, very quickly it comes a huge amount of money. And then there's all the equipment as well. Uh, all the monitoring, the habitat uh, maintenance, those sorts of things, it all costs a lot of money. So, yeah, it's going to be a lot of money in in the end. Uh, but whatever people can give, I'm so thankful. Yeah, yeah, and they can be part of that vision that you talked about, seeing the you know the the, the turtles basking in the wild in five or ten years from now. Uh, you could actually say you had a hand in that, which would be pretty cool. I, I think to wrap up because one of the things that is so obvious when. I talk to you is how much passion you have about this entire process of just 
restoring nature and, and, and interacting with wildlife. And there are probably people listening who think they would want to go down a similar path because the path that you and Tom, uh, we should also mention Tom, who isn't here as your partner in, in, in this, um, this path is in some in some sense unique because you just came out of the gates doing this. You guys are both very young. You've only been graduated from high school for a couple of years, and you are holding a book in front of me that has uh, you know Cambridge on it uh, of work that you guys have done with the university. You're rubbing shoulders with scientists, and uh, how 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 the hell did you guys pull this off? And do you have any advice for someone sitting at home thinking? this might be something I want to accomplish. Maybe they live in an area in North America or some other part of the world that has some, you know, issues uh, as far as the ecology goes and they want to help. Is there some, <laughs> is that is that a loaded question? How do you start this? Uh, very good question. I ask myself that quite a lot. I mean, it's really, it's a hard one, Dylan, because you, you know a lot of it is just going you just you're heading down a path you don't know where you're going but you know it's the right direction Mm -hmm. some part of your soul shall we say knows that you're heading towards you know the right thing and so i think number one people should do that you know if you feel like the path is the right way to go just go for it you know go for your gut but it's also I've got to thank so many other people as well for actually believing in me. You know, my family who've been incredibly supportive, given their time, you know, the people who've put money into the project. You know, there are all these people which have helped to actually accomplish what what we've done. It's never a single thing. It's never just me. It's never just Tom. It's never just the both of us. It's this whole network of people who helped to build us. It's things like my uncle. Um, my uncle got um, furloughed during COVID and he helped to build the breeding facility totally out of his own, you know, it's those people who, you know, don't want any, they don't want any praise. They don't want any, they just do it because they also believe in the vision. They think it's the right thing. So, you know, it's all those different people who've come together um, to build something, which is just, you know, incredibly thankful for it's the people like the team at Trenton, you know, who've, um, who, who've just been absolutely incredible, you know, restoring the beaver back to Trenton. It's the people um, like we like the beaver license in Lincolnshire, the the Jack and uh, Hannah Dale, the, the re, they own a business called Rendale, which is a design company. It's those people, it's all those people who put money into this that just thank them so much. It's Derek Gow, who's a reintroduction specialist who uh, has helped me all, you know, never fails to help. It's Ben Goldsmith, who's put a lot of money into it. It's all these people that have built, have, have helped me to do it. It's not just me. So there's that. So I think the second, I think naturally the second thing is 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 build connections mm-hmm. and 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 um follow good people, you know, be part of networks which want to build change. I think one of the the blessings that I have is I'm very good at reading people. I know I think I'm very good at working out whether this what a person is you know it doesn't take me very long to understand where this person you know what's their motivations and i think that sort of quality is really really useful people need to um you know when it comes to the environment when it comes to conservation uh people need to jfdi uh i don't know if you know what that that um that phrase means but it's just fucking do it. It really is. If you think, you know, if you were worried about some rare frog or some rare uh, turtle in the wild, just do it. You know, do whatever you need to do to get there. Obviously, within the confines of the law and what's ethical and things, but just make a start. Because even if you don't succeed, you know, even if at the end of all of this, we don't succeed and biodiversity collapses or, you know, the climate it spirals out of control you know whatever whatever happens we all know we can all look at each other in the eye those people who've been good those people who've not been obstructive and know that we did the right thing we tried we did the right thing and that's what people you know like Therese coffee and and those sorts of people don't get it's that spark that's in people that's in good people there are other people who are obstructive and a pain uh, really don't get. And if these people who've got that spark, these people who know the right path, who know what the right thing to do is, can link up, we'd be unstoppable. Mm. We'd help to restore nature. 
we'd help to build a better future. And I think, um, you know, physically we can help change the climate. You know, literally we can change the climate. We're never going to change the weather. You know, we never know what future, well, I'm saying this metaphorically, we never know what future challenges will await us. But we, but we know that we need to do the best we can with the time that we're given. You know, I, I was very unfortunate uh, this uh, this last year to lose a friend, a friend of mine and Tom's, to suicide. You know, we we lost back to suicide, um, and it was really one of those jarring moments, Dylan, where you just th think, oh, life is so short, life is incredibly short, and we've all got to use that time to do the best thing, to do the right thing, to do what we can to make a better world. And that's mm. it. It's that simple. Yeah, that is incredibly well said. I think there's so much in that. And uh, I, I know that will speak directly to many people. And I, and you ha and, and Tom as well, you guys have both somehow avoided the very common pitfall of looking at a very, very complex situation and simplifying it to such a small level in a naive way and in an arrogant way that, you know, we see this all the time on college campuses, you know, kids putting up signs of, a, you know, trying to simplify an entire global issue with a, with a poster. And that, yeah. you know, we, I don't get any of that from you. You know, we there's lots of this conversation. Where we talked about the nuances of problems and, you know, not just erasing mankind to solve this. And it, 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 I, I don't know how you guys did that. I mean, maybe it's your parents, or your up, upbringing, or also just getting out there and, and reading and interacting with people who are in the trenches doing the work. Something about it, you guys have avoided this, like, tendency for young people to be naively arrogant about extremely complex problems and, and you know tell everybody what to do instead you have boots on the ground you've built this facility you're actually doing the work and in a way that i think builds a ton of trust and confidence from an outsider's perspective i think i a hundred percent and i think you know it is all about nuance you know it is it is about looking at these things from a balanced perspective uh, but it's about that sort of thing that you accept that you are you're never going to be perfect you know you're never going to be able to get a hundred percent of things right and i feel like if you accept that if you understand that <coughs> sorry the dust again <laughs> if you understand that um that that's the case that the, you can only do your best people actually thank you for that a bit more Mm -hmm. um and it, it, you know it's the case with with rewilding which is one of the first things i say when we when we help people when we help landowners with with rewilding is that we're not miracle workers we're not we're not going to be able to you know we, well we can we, we're not going to be able to promise to bring back everything to this land that we've lost you know some things are just too far gone but what we can do is really try to reinvigorate uh, what we're left with and try and create something beautiful again. Um, and I think um, it's very much that. I think if you if you are honest about your approach and you're honest about what you're trying to do uh, and your limitations, people understand that, you know. And I think one of the things that I've, that I've come to do is sort of learn not to be perfect. So learn that if you just open and say, this isn't achievable, we're not going to be able to do this, um, but this is what we can do instead. People like that. People like that sort of uh, just, you know, blatant sort of honesty. Mm -hmm. um, so so there, there is that. And I think simplification um, has its has its uses. Uh, but it, as you say, it's very much can cause issues in terms of understanding nuance of, of, of how we communicate these ideas and these solutions. So. I think it's, it is it is very much a balance. I think it's also this iceberg situation that you know w w I've admitted it before in the past, but you know when we've when we've been working with the media and things before, you know we will say things which are not nuanced. Which, you know, for instance, you know reintroducing the species is easy. I mean that's one of the things I've said before. And I'm never going to say it again because <laughs> I regret that a lot. But um, Things like that get people hooked. And then what you are expecting or hoping to do is those people delve deeper. And that's exactly how I learned. You know, I learned, you know, what species had gone extinct and then dove into the detail. 
So that's what you kind of hope. So there is a use for it, but it is about being able to have that breadth of understanding mm-hmm. and not just understanding at the at the 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 end where it's simple and it's easy, that sort of thing. Yeah, if yeah, yeah. It's sense. totally yeah. It's 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 the entry point into the problem, not the exit point. And I think yeah, that's where, you know, a lot of people end up you know, we have a politician in our country who commonly his solution to the fact that the housing market is so high is just build more houses and and it's such an easy thing to say. And I always laugh because People get around this. Yeah, yeah. Build more houses, but you know who's gonna build them? Where's yeah, the yeah. money gonna come from? Where yeah. will they go? You know, there's so many things that go on top. Like you can't just end it and say, yeah, we're gonna build houses. And it's like, oh yeah. Well, there's a lot of nuance that goes into that. So to to end on the simple you know solution of building houses is is not far enough. You know, you have to dial it back. It's interesting because you know I maybe this is me being grumpy now, but uh, you know I get fed up. Sometimes we'll get fed up quite a lot of the time when I'm, you know, see a podcast like this and you've got to people talk, you know, see an environmental podcast like this and you see people talking about things and phrasing it in a way which is like, wouldn't it be great if X happened? And it's like, why aren't you doing it? Mm-hmm. Why aren't you doing it? You know, and I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. I'm not going to say you're solving the problem overnight. Why don't you start something? Why don't you start movement? Why don't you start protesting? Why don't you start a business? Whatever, you do it. And that's what annoys me is, especially in conservation in the UK and to some extent environmentalism and conservation elsewhere, we're very good at talking. We're great at talking. We love to talk. We love to talk about, you know, how theoretical things could be, how things could be better, whatever. But when it comes to action, we're really, really hard. And so, you you know, your house building analogy is kind of absolutely perfect because it's, it's, it's all, let's restore ecosystems, but how are you going to do it? Who's going to do it? Where are the species you're going to reintroduce going to come from, you know, and that's exactly it. So stop complaining (laughs) is what I'm going to say to people and just start, just put a spade in the ground, just start um, and that's what I mean about, you know, you're able to say that you've done the right thing because that you'll know that it's never going to be perfect. But as long as you make a start, you weren't the one, you know, on a podcast for 17 hours talking about how great it would be to do X or Y. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's a perfect place to wrap up. I think I think I, unless there's anything else that you definitely wanted to cover before we wrap up, I think that's a great note to end on. Is there anything that we didn't say about the projects you're working on that you wanted to mention? I don't think so. I think that I think that's been a really good update. I think the only thing I'll say, you know, is is again it, any anything you, you know any um, support you can give in terms of the crowdfund it would just be massively you know helpful you know, anything, because we're really moving at pace now with this species. And wouldn't it be great within just a, within just a few months, hopefully we could get the species back out into the wild. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that'll all be in the show notes. Can you let everybody know, uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, where they can find you guys? Um, we're, we're Celtic, we're either Celtic Reptile Amphibian or Celtic Rewild. And we're going through a bit of a, we're just having a whole new website. We're having a whole new uh, brand, all that sort of stuff. Um, and shout, to be honest, actually, shout out to Trinity Create. Um, they are a, a company which is partnered with us in order to produce our new, uh, really user-friendly website. So shout out to them. They're doing incredible work. Um, so at the moment, just try and type in Celtic Rewild and Celtic Reps. I don't know. We'll be somewhere, but it's all changing. So that's really, really unprofessional. But um, you get where I'm coming from. Absolutely. Yeah. And is the plan to film and record? You guys obviously have a YouTube channel, but you're doing a lot as well. But is the plan to keep people up to date on the project from through videos? Yeah. So the, we had a hiatus from YouTube uh, recently just because of how busy we were. But um, hopefully, say hopefully, over the next six months, we're going to be hiring uh, maybe one or two positions. That'll free up the space for us to do YouTube. So that's what we're kind of hoping going forward is that we'll be able to have more time to do YouTube because that was the whole dream. It was just sucking up so much time um, from projects. So, so yeah, we, we will come back eventually. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And in the meantime, Harvey, this was an incredible conversation. I really appreciate your time. Like you said, it's a very thorough update. And I think we got into some really important topics. And, and I think you left everybody with some amazing advice. So thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. No, thank you so much, Dylan. It's been a pleasure. All right. That is the end of that episode. Harvey, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast again. It was a fascinating conversation. And I think I can speak for listeners and say that you probably motivated many people to get off their butts and follow their passions, whatever it is that gives them that spark of joy and spark of energy. I'm sure people have listened to you speak and decided that they need to get up and do something about those passions. Because as you said, we all if we go about those things and we start pursuing things that are interesting to us, within the bounds of the law, (laughs) we will uh, make a better place. And I think you highlighted that perfectly. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed it, let us know. You can actually comment on the video on the the podcast itself on Spotify as well. So if you are a uh, Spotify podcast listener, you can watch it on Spotify now, but you can also comment too, or just head to YouTube, leave your comments and let us know what you thought. If you want to share it on social media, that also helps and goes a long way to helping us find new listeners for the show. You can find more information about the podcast at Animals at Home network.com if you want to check out the sponsor custom reptile habitats that's who sent me these beautiful enclosures behind me you can do that at the link in the show notes or the youtube description that is an affiliate link so if you make a purchase a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you and that helps me support the show so if you are interested in a new enclosure go check out their line they have incredible enclosures that are the top quality enclosures in my opinion in the country right now or north america i should say and If you do buy one, of course, you're helping support the podcast or you can head to patreon.com slash animals at home. And for as little as 75 cents an episode, you can help support the podcast that way and immediately have access to discord server and chat with other like minded individuals and have early access to the episodes. I think that is all I'm going to say today. Thank you guys so much for listening again. Harvey, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and I will catch you guys in the next episode.